Hi, we at Video Professor understand how hard it can be to learn to operate a computer. In the next few minutes, you will see just how easy we make it. You know, nothing will teach you as fast as our videos. So in no time, you will be on your way to achieving your goal, knowing how to operate your computer. By having this video, you can refer to it and learn from it at any time. Now listen to what some people just like you found by using our videos. You know, they really work. So enjoy this easy computer learning, and thanks. If you're ever trying to learn a computer system through a manual or on your own, have you ever sat there and said, God, I wish somebody who just knew how to do this would just sit down and show me. I hate trying to learn it on my own. And that's exactly what these tapes do. They sit there, they're a tutor right next to you, and they show you just how to do it. I was kind of amazed. Uh, I started out with the first one, and gosh, didn't have it on, but maybe 15 minutes and I knew more it seemed like in that short of time than I did reading 50 pages in a book. People have libraries of books, today people have libraries of tapes and Video Professor would be an integral part of a personal or a professional tape library. As a teacher I really appreciate the step-by-step -step organization of the tapes. They allow each person to work at their own pace in their own time and to review as necessary. You can go back and review whatever you want and you don't have to have a teacher there saying, don't you remember, I told you. Welcome to the Video Professor series of computer learning tapes, the nation's number one computer trainer. We'll take you step by step through learning to use your computer software. On the screen now are some other tapes available in our series. When using these tapes, we suggest you watch them in their entirety. Then go back with your computer and practice each step. In keeping with the video professor's dedication to giving you the best lesson possible, we have packed these tapes with information and sometimes move at a pace that is faster than you will be able to follow along with as you are working with your computer. Remember, you can always pause or rewind the tape to learn each part. Now let's get started. Welcome to my lesson on Microsoft Word for Windows version 6.0. This program is the newest and most powerful version yet of this increasingly popular word processing program. Together we will learn to use this program by looking at the basic skills and tools needed to create a document. Word has been designed to take full advantage of the powerful work environment provided by Windows. Using Windows, you can work with several different programs or several different documents within the same program all at the same time. For example, you can take graphics from a draw program, numbers from a spreadsheet program, and combine all these sources in Word to create a well-balanced, professional-looking document, all without a lot of complicated file exchange procedures or stopping and starting programs. Since you are preparing to learn Microsoft Word for Windows 6.0, I assume you have a basic understanding of DOS and Windows. If these are not familiar to you, I suggest you first view my lessons on getting started with your personal computer an introduction to Windows. This one hour lesson will cover the following information. Installing Microsoft Word for Windows. Working with Word, the program's setup and its features. Entering and saving text. Blocking and modifying text. Using Word's spell checker and thesaurus. And printing. And at the end of this lesson, I'll show you how to create and format your very own logo within Word 6.0. Now I'd like to introduce you to Suzanne, my student helper for this lesson. Suzanne will be demonstrating all the steps as we proceed. Simply follow along with her as we go. Viewers, you may have already installed Microsoft Word 6.0 on your system. If not, let's take a few minutes to complete that task now. On screen now are the minimum system requirements needed to install or run Word 6.0. These are minimum requirements. More memory and a faster CPU will make Word 6.0 for Windows run faster and have a smoother performance. Don't worry if you aren't completely sure of your computer's configuration. Word's installation program checks your system for hardware and software compatibility before loading the rest of the program. Viewers, before installing Word, it is a good idea to make copies of the original master disks. Once copied, use those copies to do the installation. This will eliminate potential damage to your master disk during the installation process due to floppy or hard drive malfunctions. The keyboard is certainly necessary to type your sentences and paragraphs in Word. 
However, I suggest you have a keyboard and a mouse for this lesson. A mouse is strongly recommended in order to take full advantage of this powerful environment. We'll be using a two-button mouse. In the first half of this lesson, you will be shown how the mouse and keyboard are used within a document and how each is used to select options within the pull-down menus and dialog boxes. Later in the lesson, I will demonstrate the command I believe to be the most appropriate for the situation. It may be a mouse command or it may be a keyboard command. Either way, you'll be able to follow along. Later in this lesson, we'll save our files to disk. Suzanne and I will save to a floppy disk to avoid cluttering up the hard drive. I suggest that you two have an empty formatted diskette on hand to save your video professor results. Turn on your computer and start Windows if you have not already done so. You must have Windows running to operate Word, and you'll need the Windows Program Manager open to install Word. It's also a good idea to close any other programs you might have had running to give your computer maximum memory for installation. Move your mouse to the menu bar near the top of the screen to the word file. With a pointer on the word file, click your left mouse button one time. This will pull down a menu of further options. Select run by placing the mouse pointer on the word run and again clicking the left mouse button one time. Keyboard users press your Alt and F keys together for file, then R for run. Place setup disk number one in your floppy drive A. Notice a box appears, but it is not another menu. This is called a dialog box, and its function is to accept and process specific instructions you give it. In this instance, we want to install Microsoft Word, so type A colon backslash setup. And click on OK or press the Enter key on your keyboard. This will start Word's installation process. Word will first ask you if you wish to personalize your copy of the program. To do this, type your name in the box labeled Name. Type the name of your business, if applicable, in the Organization box. Click on Continue or use the Enter key to accept this information. Word Setup will next ask you where on your system you wish to install the program and require you to make some other decisions regarding the program setup. To accept Word suggestions, simply select the OK button each time or use the Enter key on your keyboard. Word will ask you to select from three installation options. Typical, Complete Custom, or Laptop Minimum Installation. Laptop Minimum Installation is useful when disk space is limited, such as when installing Word on a laptop computer or if your computer is low on hard drive space. Complete Custom gives you the option to choose only those Word features you expect to use. This also allows you to save some hard drive space. We'll use the typical installation since we have plenty of space on our system and we can let Setup make all the correct choices. Word will prompt you to insert each numbered Setup disk in order. Continue to follow the instructions provided in the boxes until Setup tells you it is finished. The complete installation should take about 10 or 15 minutes. When installation is finished, Click on the OK button or press Enter. If you did the typical installation, Word will now create a set of three icons, all contained within a group window which Word will name Microsoft Office. If you chose a custom or laptop install, the icons will vary in number. Viewers, if you did not do the installation sequence, please join us now as we proceed. Turn on your computer and start Windows. To open the Microsoft Word program, use the arrow keys to highlight the icon and press Enter. Or point to the icon with your mouse and click the left mouse button twice very quickly. This will start the program. Popping up on the screen now is one of Word's new additions to the 6.0 version, a tip of the day. Viewers, your tip will probably be different than ours. These helpful hints will appear each time you open the program and provide useful information as well as tongue-in-cheek humorous side notes. You may choose to see further individual tips by selecting Next Tip or see a list of all the tips by choosing More Tips. Viewers, click on OK to close this tip and get on with our lesson. You can also use the Enter key to close this dialog box. Let's now take a few minutes to get familiar with the setup of the Microsoft Word screen and its many easy-to-use features. If you've just installed Word, your screen should look like ours. This is the out-of-the-box screen display. Word automatically sets these default display features. However, if you are working on a system where Word 6.0 was already installed, someone may have changed the screen setup so yours doesn't match ours. There is nothing wrong. 
People just have different preferences for their workspace. As we explore the screen, I'll give commands for suggested changes to your display. By the end of our tour, everyone should have the same look on the screen, and you'll know how to set up your own preferences. Now let's begin our voyage by looking at basic screen features. At the very top of the screen is the title bar where you see the name of your program followed by the name of the document you are actually working in. Since this is a new document, it is called Document 1. On the left side of the title bar is the Windows Control Menu. Suzanne, press your Alt and Spacebar keys together to open it. The Control Menu contains various commands to control the size and position of the Word window on the Windows desktop. It also allows you to close Word or switch to another program using the Window Task Swapper. Suzanne, press your Escape key to close the Control Menu. On the right-hand side of the title bar are the Window Sizing buttons. They are the mouse command equivalents to the sizing commands in the Control Menu. You should recognize these as well as those in the control menu from my Windows tape. If your Word application window doesn't fill the computer screen, use the control menu's maximize option or click on the maximize button to give yourself a full screen view. Inside the Word for Windows application window is a smaller window called the document. In this view, the document window has merged with the application window, so it is not easy to see that it is a separate window. Suzanne, click on the Document Restore icon to return the document window to its smaller size. That's the up-down arrows just below the title bar. With the document window less than maximum size, it's easy to see it as a separate window. It is also easier to see the features that belong to the Word application window. The document window is where we'll actually do our word processing. When you open Word, this new blank document is automatically opened. In general, the data you enter is stored and displayed in the document, that's the smaller window, while the power to manipulate that data comes from the application window. The Word application window frame appears on the Windows desktop. The document window appears within the application window. We can refer to the application window as the parent and the document window as the child. You must have an application program or parent open before you can have a child document open. You may have multiple children running within the parent window. That is, you can have several documents open within the Word application. Now, Suzanne, let's size the document window using the keyboard. Simply press your Alt and Dash keys together to open the control menu for the document. Once open, press the X key to maximize the window. Below the title bar is the menu bar, so named because this is where you will find the power to access all of Word's function menus. With this menu bar, you have access to every command in Word, excluding those that are mouse-only options. Click on the word File or type Alt-F to bring down the file menu. As we just demonstrated, you simply use your mouse to point and click on a menu name to open its pull-down menu. Once the menu is open, a single click on the desired command activates that command. To select a command from the keyboard, you must first open the menu containing the desired option. You do this by holding the Alt key and typing the underscored letter in the menu name. The options in the pull-down menu can be activated by typing the underscored letter in the command name. Or you can use your arrow keys to highlight a command, then press the Enter key to activate it. You'll also notice that some of the pull-down menu commands have a keyboard key or key combination listed next to them. You can use these hotkeys to invoke that command without opening the menu. They won't work when the menu is open. The three little dots next to some of the commands are called ellipses. When next to a command, they indicate that additional information or choices are available for that command. These choices are stored in dialog boxes. Suzanne, select the Save As command. This, too, is a dialog box. It is designed specifically to help us with the Save As command. It also contains features seen in many other Word 6.0 dialog boxes. It has areas to enter and or select information, drop-down menus for option selection, an option button that allows another level of information to be selected, a help button, which if selected, will give us a help screen that can help answer questions on this command and its various options. Some dialog boxes will list helpful information concerning the option, too. We don't need to use this dialog box now, so click on the Cancel button or press your Escape key to close it. The Help menu is on the far right side of the menu bar and is a standard menu on all Windows programs. Let's take a look, Suzanne. Click on the word Help to pull down its menu. 
Within this menu, you have many ways in which to seek help on Word 6.0 options and procedures. The first three commands, Contents, Search for Help On, and Index allow quick access to almost any subject or option in Word 6.0. The other commands provide various kinds of help, such as providing assistance to those people whose previous word processing experience was in WordPerfect. Press your Escape key to close Help Suzanne, and we'll move on to our next subject. Suzanne, there's a lot of power on the menu bar, to be sure, and we've only just begun our tour of Word screen display. Below the menu bar, you have two rows called toolbars. These show up as part of the default view, but it's very easy to change. Suzanne, pull down the view menu. Within it are several commands that control the way our screen looks while we work. The four choices, normal, outline, page layout, and master document, each show different information about the document as you are working. These control our editing or screen view. These affect our view of the application window and how your document's information is displayed. They don't control the look of the finished printed document. A dot or bullet next to a view option means that option is selected. The normal view is the default for this setting. Suzanne has this view and it is the view I want everyone to be in. If you have a different view, just click on normal to select it. Or use your up and down arrow keys to highlight normal and press your enter key. If you selected a new view, your screen will reconfigure. And if you do, pull down the view menu again. We have some more work to do there. The full screen command will give you a blank screen to work with. No menu, no toolbars. We really want to learn to use these tools, so we'll skip over that command and move on to toolbars. Suzanne, select the toolbars command. Within this dialog box, we see all the toolbars currently available to us. At the top of the list are the standard and formatting toolbars which Suzanne has showing on her screen. These are the default toolbars chosen for us at the time of installation. Notice that the boxes next to these options have X's in them. Suzanne, click inside the box next to the database option. An X appears in the box next to it. The X indicates that option is now active. Now click on OK. We now have another toolbar on screen. This one displays option buttons used in Word 6.0's database operations. We don't need this toolbar for this lesson, so let's deactivate it. Pull down the View menu and select Toolbars again. Now press your down arrow key until the Database option is highlighted. Once it is, press the space bar to toggle the X off, deactivating that option. Press Enter, and the Database toolbar disappears. All the toolbars are toggled on and off this way. Now pull down the View menu again and select the Toolbars command. If the Standard and Formatting Toolbar options aren't active at this time, please use your mouse or keyboard to toggle them on. Viewers, make sure these two options have an X next to them. If any other option is turned on, toggle it off by removing the X in its option box. Now look at the bottom of the dialog box. There are three additional choices. The first allows you to select color buttons, which does exactly as it says. Deselecting this option will show your toolbars in black and white. Selecting this option will add color to your toolbar if you have a color monitor. The second option is large buttons. Press your Alt and L keys together to select this option. Now press Enter. Take a look at your toolbar. The buttons have become so enlarged they spread sideways right off the screen. Pull down the View menu and choose Toolbars again. Once the dialog box is open, press your Alt and L keys together again to toggle the X off in the Large Buttons option box. The third option is Show Tooltips. The purpose of this option will be demonstrated in just a minute. Be sure it is checked. Now, after all our experiments, make sure the standard and formatting toolbars, the color buttons, and the Show Toolbar Tips options are toggled on. If any other option besides these are active, toggle it off by removing the X in its option box. Now click on OK or use the Enter key to close this dialog box. Go back to the View menu and look at the option for Ruler. The check mark shows that the ruler has been turned on. Do you see it just under the toolbars on your screen, Suzanne? It's a very useful tool. We can use it to set right and left document margins in addition to setting and removing tabs. We won't be using it in this lesson, so click on Ruler to turn it off and give us a little more screen space. The last view option we need to look at is the zoom control. Suzanne, pull down the view menu again. 
At the bottom of the menu is the Zoom command. Select it. This brings up a dialog box. On the left are your view choices. The number represents the percent of magnification of your page, just like on a copy machine. The large numbers, such as 200%, give you a larger view of your work, but less of it fits on the screen. Smaller percentage numbers, such as 75%, allow you to see more of the full page. Suzanne, press your up arrow to select 200%. Notice how the little preview screen in the dialog box changes to show us what the view at that zoom percentage will look like. Now press your down arrow key to go through the other choices. The preview screen changes with each selection. Changing the view only affects the look of the document on your screen. It will not alter the size of any graphics or text. Also notice that there is a percent option in the lower left corner of this dialog box. This zoom option and the one at the right side of the top toolbar allows you to select a more precise zoom percentage. For now, everyone makes sure 100% is selected within the Zoom 2 box and then click on OK. Now we should have most of the screen details arranged. But there's one more place we'll look at, Suzanne, in order to set up screen display preferences as well as several other controls. Pull down the Tools menu with your mouse or by pressing the Alt and T keys together and then select Options all the way at the bottom of the list. Here is a dialog box stuffed full of choices. We're interested in the View Options, which probably came up in front as you can see here. Viewers, if it didn't, just click on the View tab at the top of the screen. The Option folder has three sections, and each has several checkoff boxes to turn the choices on or off. Here again, the choices selected within this dialog box are default settings. As we look at each area, please select the same choices as Suzanne's. When you finish with the lesson, you can return these and any other settings to their original state. In the Show section, none of the choices should be checked off. As you can see on our screen, all the boxes in this section are empty. In the Window section, all three boxes are marked with X's, so we can use the Status Bar and the Scroll Bars. Style Area Width should be set at zero. And in the non-printing characters area, only the box at the bottom for all should be checked. These non-printing characters give us visual clues as to what is happening in our document. With these options checked, click OK or press the Enter key to close the dialog box and apply any changes to the screen. Now that we have the same tools and view options on screen, let's finish looking at the Word 6.0 environment. Below the menu bar is the standard toolbar. With it, you can quickly access many of the most commonly used commands and features in Word, such as saving and opening documents. Below the standard toolbar is the formatting bar. This toolbar allows you quick and easy access to the most commonly used text and document format features, such as alignment and font selection. Professor, do I have to use these toolbar buttons to edit my document? Suzanne, no, but toolbars contain the most commonly used word processing features and some of the more advanced options. By simply clicking your mouse on a button, Word will perform that function for you in one step without having to use the pull-down menus that require more steps to perform the same function. You can, however, access these functions using keyboard commands and pull-down menus. In fact, there will be times when you'll want to use the features from the menu that are not included on the toolbar. Many of the buttons on the toolbars are easy to decipher. With others, it is a little harder to understand their function. Word helps us with some simple clues. Suzanne, point, but don't click your mouse on the second button on the left side of the standard toolbar. A yellow box will pop up with a one-word description of that button's function. Move your mouse pointer to the right, pointing to the next three or four buttons. These descriptions are the Show Toolbar Tips option we checked off in the Toolbar's dialog box. At the bottom of the screen is the Status Bar. It's a multi-purpose screen area depending on what you are doing at the moment. Look at the left side of the Status Bar. It gives a more detailed description of the tool. So if the tooltip isn't enough information, just glance down at the Status Bar for further details. Now move your mouse pointer down into the text area, Suzanne. When you are not pointing to a tool button, the status bar shows your exact location of the insertion point in the document by page number, section, measurement on the page, and column. The symbols at the bottom left-hand corner just above the status bar are quick function tool buttons that allow you to change your screen view with the click of a button. The first is for normal view, 
which is the view we chose a few moments ago. Suzanne pointed to the middle button. The tooltip indicates this button will activate the page layout view. Move your pointer up into the white area again. Now look at the boxes on the right half of the status bar. These boxes give information about the status of the program by highlighting a command or a conditions abbreviation, as we'll soon see in this lesson. Below the formatting toolbar is the text area, the document workspace. Here is where you will do all your typing. The flashing vertical line is the insertion point. The solid underline marks the end of the text area. The symbol that looks like a backward P is called a paragraph mark. It and a number of symbols were activated when we checked the All button in the Options View folder. More symbols will appear as we enter and work with text. On the right-hand side and at the bottom of your document window are the standard Windows application scroll bars. You'll remember them from my introduction to Windows tape. The vertical scroll bar on the right moves your view of a document up and down, and the horizontal scroll bar moves your view left or right. Now that we know the various screen areas, Suzanne, let's enter some text. Before we start typing, look at the right side of the status bar. The second box from the right has the abbreviation OVR in it. That stands for overtype. Press the keyboard's insert key, Suzanne. The OVR is highlighted, which means it is active. Press the insert button again. This toggles overtype off and returns us to the default function of insert. In insert mode, you can add new text wherever the insertion point is located. In overtype, Typing new characters replaces the existing text. Please type Video Professor at the top of the document, just as you see it here, including the mistakes. Notice how the insertion point moves along at the end of your typing as you enter text. The insertion point serves as a place marker in a document. It shows where your work will take place. I made a mistake typing your name. How can I fix it? Suzanne, one way to correct small mistakes is to use the backspace key. Backspace once over the end to erase it. You can use the backspace key to erase characters to the left of the cursor, one character at a time. Now type the correct letter R. There's another error in video. You type two E, Suzanne. You could backspace over everything to the first E, then retype the correct spelling for video professor, but that would be a waste of time. It's easier to move the insertion point in front of the mistake, then correct it. Here is where the relationship between the insertion point and the mouse pointer, eye bar, begins. Position the eye bar in between the two E's in video and click your left mouse button. Do you see what happened to the insertion point? It jumped to join the eye bar. Now you can backspace out the extra E. Now use the mouse to move the insertion point to the end of the line. Remember to click the left mouse button to move the insertion point to join your mouse. This method of moving the insertion point works no matter how long or short your document is. Let's type some more text in your document. First, press the Enter key three times to add some blank lines after the first line. We are given three more paragraph marks or hard returns. They represent the end of a paragraph, even if there isn't anything in the paragraph. Also notice that in between the words we can see a little dot. This represents one character space. It was entered for us when we hit the space bar. Displaying characters such as paragraph marks and spaces enable you to see at a glance whether you have typed an extra space, type spaces instead of a tab character, and so on. Although these characters are displayed, they will not be printed. However, they can be inserted or deleted on your screen just like our normally typed characters. Up on the left side of the formatting toolbar are the font and font size boxes. Suzanne's font, Times New Roman at 10 point, is the default font and size. If you have something else appearing here, click on either box's mini pull-down menu and select the correct font and size. You may need to use the mini scroll bar to locate the proper choice. When you find it, just click on the appropriate choice to select it. Okay, everyone limber up your fingers and enter the following paragraph in your document exactly as you see it on the screen. I know it has a few errors in it, but we'll fix those using some more of Word's editing tools. Do not press your Enter key at the end of each line as you would on a typewriter. As you type, the text will automatically move on to the next line when it reaches the end of the current line. This is called Word Wrap. It is a standard feature of all word processing programs. 
The return or enter key is used only when you want to create a new paragraph or add blank lines. Viewers, you may need a little extra time to enter this, so pause or rewind the tape until you have entered all the text. Now we can take a look at some of Word's editing features. As we correct the text, I'll give you a few shortcut keyboard commands that move the insertion point to different areas of text. We'll look at a few now and add more as we work with the text. Remember, you can always use the mouse to move the insertion point. Press the home plus the left arrow key. This returns the insertion point to the beginning of the line. Now press the end key. It moves the insertion point to the end of the line. Press the home and up arrow key and we are moved to the very top of our document. Now press your down arrow key three times to move the insertion point to the first line of our version of President Lincoln's famous speech, the Gettysburg Address. Now press the delete key three times to erase the first word. When you use the delete key, it erases whatever is immediately to the right of the cursor, one character at a time. Now type the correct spelling of the word for, F-O-U-R. See how the words move over to make room for this insertion? Using your mouse or the arrow keys, move your insertion point in front of the second brought. We need to change this word to fourth. There are several ways we can do this. The first would be simply erasing the word and then type in the new word. But there's another way. Push the insert button again to activate the overtype function. Now simply type the word fourth and then use the delete key to eliminate the extra letters. Press the insert key again to turn overtype off and make insert mode active again. Suzanne, press the enter key. Your screen shows one of the backward P paragraph marks. And the text following just moved down a line. Professor, that looks dumb. The line shouldn't move down like that. How can I erase it? You're right, Suzanne. We don't really want that paragraph break, but instead of simply erasing it, I want to show you another of Word's powerful editing functions. Let's undo that mistake. Up at the top of the screen on the standard toolbar is the undo button, the one with the left pointing curved arrow. Click on that button and your unwanted hard return disappears. You can also find this command under the edit menu. Excluding saving and naming files, the undo function will reverse all previous actions. New to this version of Word is a multiple undo feature. This means that Word remembers in order everything you do in your document and can go back many steps to undo what you've done. Click on the right down arrow next to the undo button. Here is a list in reverse order beginning with your most recent action of everything you've done to this document. To undo multiple actions, you just drag down the list to mark as many steps as you want. We've already undone the unwanted steps, Suzanne, so click on the arrow key to close this button without taking any further action. Next to the undo button is the redo button. You click on the redo button to redo or reverse the last cancel action performed by undo. It too has a list of multiple actions from which you can choose. Before we go any further with our corrections, let's save our text to disk. There are several ways to save our document, Suzanne. Pull down the file menu. Professor, there are three save choices here. Which one of them should I use? Good question, Suzanne. Each one of the three choices has a specific purpose. And we can get some tips right on the screen while we figure out which one of the commands we need. Use your arrow key to move the highlight down to save. And look at the status bar. This command saves the active document. Save is used to save any changes to an existing file after you've named it. Well, that sounds good. Before we select it, let's check the other commands. Arrow down one more to check Save As. According to the status bar, this one saves a copy of the document in a separate file. Save As is used when you are saving a new document for the first time or if you need to save the same document with a different name. It could be useful since we don't have a file yet. Arrow down once more, Suzanne. Save All saves all open files. Save All is useful when you are preparing to exit Word and need to save all your work. Well, we only have this one file, so that's probably overkill. Looks like Save As is the one we want. Press your up arrow and then Enter to select Save As. A dialog box appears where you can tell Word exactly how and where you wish your document to be saved. 
First, look in the middle of the box at the directory list. This is where you need to tell Word what document directory you wish your work to be saved in. If you performed a standard installation of Word, the setup program created a directory entitled WinWord on your computer's hard drive or C drive. This directory was created as a place to store your Word documents if you chose to store documents on your hard drive. WinWord is Word's default directory. The C colon backslash WinWord displayed above the directory box indicates the chosen DOS path name that the soon to be named file will be saved to. Below the directory box is the drive selector. Displayed here is the default drive of C, which is Suzanne's hard drive. You can also save your documents on floppy disks. Let's do that with this document. Insert your blank formatted disk into drive A of your computer. Now you need to select that drive to tell Word where you want your document to go. Click on the down arrow, Suzanne, and a list of available drives will appear. Viewers, your list might be different than ours. It simply reflects the drives available on your specific computer. Suzanne, select the A drive. When you select A drive, Word will change the entries in the dialog box to reflect the directories on the A disk. In our case, none at all. The path name changes to reflect our disk change. The file list will also change to show you what other files, if any, are contained on the disk in the drive you selected. The file name text box at the top left of the dialog box is where you give your file a name. File names can be any combinations of letters, keyboard symbols, or numbers up to eight characters. Each file name is followed by a period and a three-letter extension, which tells you what kind of document it is. Word will automatically add the file name extension, period, DOC, if you do not give it another extension. The extension signifies that your file is a Word file, and Word uses this extension to keep all its children or document files organized. Let's call our file Practice. Suzanne pressed the Alt and N keys together to select the file name box, then type Practice as the file name. You don't need to type a .doc. Word will add the extension automatically according to the file type, which you may specify in the Save File as Type at the bottom of the dialog box. The file type prompt at the bottom of the dialog box shows Word document as the default. Click on the arrow to the right of this box to see this option's choices. The choices listed here allow you to convert and save your document into a variety of other file format types. Saving your Word document in another format type, such as WordPerfect, will allow the saved document to be easily read by that program. This is valuable if you must share your files with other people using different programs, or if you use different programs to do your work. For our purposes, be sure Word document appears in this box. Once all the proper selections have been made, click on OK or press Enter. Word is now saving the document. Look at the title bar at the top of the screen. The new document name, Practice, plus the DOC file extension replaces the old name, Document 1. All the work you have done up to this point has been saved on your floppy disk. Now go back to the File menu and select Close. You have just closed this working document. Notice that when you close your document, the menu bar changes. When no documents are open, only File and Help are available as menu options, because those are the only ones you can use at this time. You can open your document again by using the File menu and selecting Open, but let's use the toolbar instead. The second button from the left, the one with the opening folder, is a fast way to access the File Open command. Click your mouse on that button. Notice that this dialog box looks a lot like the one you used in saving the document just moments ago. Under the file name box is the file save list of all the documents contained on that drive that match the file type. Double click on the practice file name. This will bring your document back. Now close this file again by pulling down the file menu and selecting close. I will show you one more quick way to retrieve documents. Pull down the file menu again. Notice that the list of options is much shorter now. The reason for this is no documents are open at this time. And look at the bottom of the menu. Here is a list of the last documents you have worked on in Word, with the most recent one on top. Simply click on the file practice and it will be reopened. Or press the number key that is listed next to the desired file. 
Press the number one key, Suzanne. So far, you have learned how to move within Word, how to enter text, and how to save and open your documents. Now, let's move on to one of word processing's most powerful editing tools, blocking text. A basic rule of thumb when working with most word processing programs is that you must first identify what part or parts of your work you wish to modify. Then, you must perform the modification. This is sometimes known as point and shoot. The way to do this is by blocking portions of the text then performing any of the many functions available. You can mark one word or many pages and modify the format, the appearance, or the location of that particular piece of text. Text is blocked by highlighting. This can be done with either the mouse or the keyboard. Suzanne, move your pointer down to the beginning of the four score paragraph, then click your left mouse button. Hold it down and drag the mouse slowly to the right. You can block one letter, one word, or a single line. Moving down will mark more lines or an entire paragraph. See how the text becomes highlighted? When the entire paragraph is highlighted, release the button. Suzanne, click next to the F and 4. Look what happens. The highlight disappears and your cursor returns to the beginning of your paragraph. You can use the keyboard to block text as well. This option may in fact sometimes be easier, particularly when dealing with smaller or very specific pieces of text. Suzanne, hold the shift key and use the right arrow key to highlight the first three or four words. Now, while still holding down the shift key, press the down arrow key once, then once again. There are many different ways to highlight text using both the mouse and keyboard. We don't have time to cover them all now, but as we continue, we'll add a few more into the mix. Once you have a section of text marked, you can do virtually anything to it. Why don't we copy this text into a new location? Suzanne, on the standard toolbar, there is a button with two identical pieces of paper on it. That is the copy command. Click on that button. When you copy a piece of text, Word saves that copy in a place known as the clipboard. The clipboard is a temporary storage area where the copied text is held until you tell Word what to do with it. In this case, you have copied your paragraph and Word is waiting for your instructions about where to put the copied text. You do this by positioning your cursor at the new location. Let's put it directly after the original sentence. Move your insertion point down to the end of your paragraph and press the spacebar twice. The highlighting on your marked text will disappear, but don't worry. It's safe on the clipboard. When you insert copied text, it's called pasting. But just as there is a copy button on the toolbar, there is also a button for paste right next to it, the one with the document coming off the little clipboard. Suzanne, your cursor is in position where you want the new text to appear. Click the Paste button on the toolbar. Paste is also found on the Edit menu. There, now you have a copy of our first line. A real handy thing to know about the clipboard is that you can paste whatever is in it into new areas over and over. Suzanne, press the Enter key twice and then paste the copy again by clicking on the paste button. There's our famous sentence again, this time in a new paragraph. Suzanne blocked four score and seven years ago in this newly copied block of text. Once done, click on the little button with the pair of scissors on it. This is the cut button. That section of text is now on the clipboard, replacing the entire sentence we had copied onto the clipboard earlier. Now move the insertion point to the beginning of the original four score sentence, then click on the paste button. Notice how the cut and paste affects the contents of the first and last areas of text. Word automatically adjusted them to accommodate the addition of text in the first sentence. Now click on the undo button once and we remove the pasted copy from the first sentence. Click on the undo button again and we undo the cut procedure. The four score selection is back in the third line. Besides using text blocking to cut, copy, or paste, you can also use it to delete individual words, sentences, or entire sections of text much quicker than deleting one character at a time using the backspace or delete key. Suzanne, click and drag your mouse pointer to block the four paragraph marks that separate paragraphs two and three. 
Now press your delete key. At the bottom of the status bar, Word asks if we want to delete the block. This is a nice safety feature that makes you think twice before deleting. We do want to delete, so press the Y key to answer yes. We'll use this bigger paragraph to do a little experimentation. To block one word, position the mouse pointer on forefathers in the first line of this paragraph and double click with your left mouse button. We could delete the word now, but let's try another blocking technique. To block a sentence, place your cursor anywhere in a sentence, hold down the control key on the keyboard, and click your left mouse button once. Do that now to block the remainder of this sentence. See how quick it is? But don't delete it. To block an entire paragraph, just triple click anywhere within the text area. Press the delete key and Y for yes and the entire paragraph is gone. When you use a delete function, Word assumes you no longer need that piece of text or want to work with it, so it does not hold it in clipboard memory. However, you can restore deletions in reverse order by using your very good friend, the undo key. Click on undo once, Suzanne, and watch the paragraph reappear. We really didn't need this, so click on redo to redo our delete. Go back to the very top of your document and delete the line that says Video Professor. Now type the words by Abraham Lincoln. When you finish, highlight the phrase and press your right mouse button. On screen now is one of Word 6.0's quick new features, the shortcut menu. Shortcut menus contain commands related to the item you're working with. They appear right where you are working. The number of commands and which ones are offered depend upon the area of text or graphics you are working in. Our selected text is very simple, so we are given some basic commands. Let's cut and paste this byline to another place in the document. The shortcut menu commands for cut, copy, and paste work the same as those on the standard toolbar and those under the edit menu. Click on the cut command, Suzanne. Now move the insertion point two lines below the word conceived. Now press your right mouse button again to bring up the basic shortcut menu. Within it, select paste. The byline is moved with a few clicks of the mouse. Suzanne, move your cursor back to the beginning of your document and type the words, the Gettysburg Address. This is your title. Before we go on to the next section, take a minute to save your document. This time, use the Fast Save button on the toolbar since you are saving the same document to the same file. No dialog box will appear or is necessary. It is always a good idea to proofread all your documents no matter what their size. Word provides some very powerful tools to make producing perfect documents easy. The first of these tools we'll look at is the Spell Check program. And to help us understand its time-saving features a little better, let's make a copy of the first sentence, Suzanne. First, block the sentence. Then use the shortcut menu to copy it. Once done, move the insertion point to the paragraph marker just before the byline. Press your Enter key once. Now use the shortcut menu to paste the copy. Once done, move the insertion point to the beginning of the first four-score line. Suzanne just left of the scissors button is the spell checking button. It brings up Word Spell Check Program. Click on it. You can also activate Spell Check by pulling down the Tools menu and selecting Spelling. Word Spell Check Program contains a built-in standard dictionary. When you activate Spell Check, Word scans your document from the insertion point on matching the words you have typed in against its dictionary. It will stop and highlight those words that it does not recognize or words where it finds something wrong. The first word spell check doesn't recognize is the misspelling of a pawn. Take a look at the dialog box. The first line shows you the word in your document that does not match the dictionary. Underneath that is a box entitled Change To, followed by a list of suggestions. These are the closest matches to the misspelled word in your document that Word can find in its dictionary. Chances are the word you really want to use is on this list. In this case it is. U-P-O-N is the proper spelling. So click on that choice in this list. The word now appears in the Change To box. 
If we decide to change the spelling, the word inside the Change To box will replace the highlighted word in our text. Now look at the buttons on the right side of the Spell Check dialog box. Choosing Ignore means that you prefer the spelling you already have, and you want Word to ignore it one time. Ignore All tells Word to ignore that particular word throughout the entire document. Change means you wish Word to change the misspelled word to the word in the Change To box one time. Change All tells Word to make that change every time it encounters that word throughout the entire document. The Add button allows you to add the selected word, if valid, to her custom dictionary for future reference. Suzanne, click on Change to correct Upon. Notice that the first Upon was corrected, but the second was left alone. Now let's see how to correct multiple misspellings of the same word. Continent with two C's is the next error spell check finds, and the correct spelling is suggested. This time, Suzanne, click on Change All. The first spelling of continent was clearly corrected, but the second misspelling was not. However, whenever spell checker runs across the misspelled word, it will automatically correct it for us. Here's a pawn again. Since we only corrected the spelling in the first sentence, the incorrect spelling remains in the second copy of that sentence. This time the correct spelling is already suggested, so just click on the change button again and it too is changed. Also notice that spell check automatically corrected the second misspelling of continent. The next item Word stops on is Gettysburg. Although this word is spelled correctly, Word's standard dictionary does not recognize it. The standard dictionary doesn't recognize technical vocabulary, many proper names, place names, or foreign words. When words like these appear, we can select an ignore button to leave the word as it is and move on. This would work here, but spell check will still see it as a misspelling in any other document. However, we do have a useful solution to this problem. During installation, a custom dictionary was created for us. By selecting the Add button, we can add any word to this custom dictionary. Once a word is in this dictionary, it will be recognized as a valid word for all documents. Suzanne, click on the Add button to enter Gettysburg into this custom dictionary. When Word has finished spell checking your document, it tells you it is done. Click OK and the speller will close. Your document is now spelled correctly, but we still have a couple of semantic corrections to make. The word country is not really the correct word here. What is the right word? Well, in this case, you probably know. But what if you didn't? Or what if you needed to find a better word? You could use the thesaurus that is built into Word to help you out. A thesaurus is similar to a dictionary, but instead of definitions, it lists words that mean the same or the exact opposite of the word in question. A thesaurus is a valuable tool for finding just the right word when writing. Place the cursor on the word country. Pull down the Tools menu and select Thesaurus to open Word's Thesaurus. The menu also shows you that Shift F7 is the quick key combination to open this tool. There's no button on the toolbar for this function. The Looked Up section in the top left corner of the dialog box is there simply to remind you of what word you started with. Below that box is a list of meanings. Since many words have more than one meaning, you must help Word by telling it which meaning is closest to the one you really want. This helps it find the most appropriate synonyms. Sometimes you have to look no further than this list of meanings itself to find the right word. As in this case, nation is the word we are looking for. But suppose you wish to use a different word meaning the same thing. Click on nation in the meanings list and a whole new list of synonyms appears in the replace with column. Click on kingdom, Suzanne. Then click on the look up button to see still another list of options that you could choose from. Notice that the choice you highlight automatically appears in the Replace With Synonym box. Click on the Previous button to get back to your original list of choices and select Nation again. Select Replace to tell Word to replace the old word with your new selection. And there it is. Also notice that Word and Word Wrap shortened and adjusted the length of the sentence. Your thesaurus changes are effective only at the place where you change them unlike the change all feature in the spell checker. So both sentences in the first paragraph still have the original words in them. We'll delete the last sentence, so all that is left to do is to correct one word. Do you know what it is? That's right, Suzanne, the word women in this case should read men. In this lesson, you have learned several ways to edit this text. Go ahead and make this last correction using any method you like. 
Before we proceed to our final step, delete the final sentence. Now be sure to save your document with all your changes. Now you're ready to print this document. To do so, you of course must have a printer hooked up to your computer and the proper print driver already installed. Once your system is all set up, printing any document in Word 6.0 is easy. Viewers, if you do not have a printer attached to your system, just watch this section and follow along for future use. But before you actually print, it's always a good idea to take a last look at how your document will look to be sure you have not made any undetected format errors. To do this, we will use the Print Preview function. As with all of Word's most commonly used functions, there is a button on the button bar which will quickly get you a preview of your document. Click on the Print Preview button. It is located just left of the Spell Checking button, and a small version of your page will appear. Although you cannot read the print on this preview, it gives you an overall view of how your page will look when it is printed. If your document has more than one page, you can preview subsequent or previous pages by using the Page Up and Page Down keys. We are given a new toolbar with specific buttons for working with previews. Suzanne moved the mouse pointer into the preview page. The pointer turns into a small magnifying glass. To use it, just move it over a section or specific piece of text and click to magnify that area. This is a good way to spot check your document, especially if the document doesn't look right in the main preview screen. Now select Close to get out of preview mode. Now let's print. Select Print from the File menu, and once more a dialog box will appear. Word offers many options for printing, and requires you to answer several prompts before it will print. Viewers, the choices in this dialog box are specific to the printer, so your options may be different than ours. Our first field is entitled Printer and displays which printer is currently selected. If you have more than one printer available to you, or if you have a fax program as a print option, you can switch between your printer options by clicking open the printer's button and selecting a different printer. Suzanne, click on Printer. Another dialog box lists all the printers available to us. If you have only one printer option, it will automatically be your default printer and will be the only printer listed here. If you have more than one printer listed here, you can tell Word which one to use by simply highlighting the desired selection and then clicking on the Set as Default Printer button. If you select a new default printer, the Cancel field changes to Close. Once this happens, you can close this submenu dialog box and return to the main print dialog box. Suzanne, we will print to an HP LaserJet 2. So make sure it is listed as the default printer, then click Close. If you don't wish to change anything, just click on Cancel when the dialog box first appears. Here we are back at the first dialog box. Under the printer is the Print What field. Pull down this Options mini menu by either clicking on the arrow or using your arrow keys. Look at all the choices. You can print the actual document itself, which is what you will probably be printing most of the time, but you can also choose to print, say, just a document summary. For now, make sure Document appears in the Print What field and press your Tab key. And at the next option, Word asks you to tell it how many copies of your document you want. You probably only want to print one copy of this document, so leave it as it is. Print Range tells Word exactly what portion of your document you want printed. You can print the entire document, just the current page, or a selection of particular pages. We want to print our entire document, which is only one page. Word has selected all as its default setting. So unless you tell it otherwise, Word will print all the document. Because this is a one-page document, you can select either all or current page, because in a one-page document, it means the same thing. Click on current page, Suzanne, and see how the black dot moves to mark the new selection. At the bottom of the page is another field called print, which gives you the option of printing either the entire range of pages or just the odd or just the even numbered pages. Be sure all pages and range appears in the field. The last decisions to be made are found in two boxes in the bottom right hand corner. Print to file allows you to save a printed version of a document in a file for later use. Be sure there is not an X in that box. Collate copies is helpful when you are printing more than one copy of your document. 
The X in ours is the default setting which makes sure separate copies are arranged in page order. There are other options available using the Options button. These options are more advanced and would need a more thorough explanation, so we'll leave them as they are for now. Well, it looks like we're all set, so click on that OK button and you're printing. You don't have to go through the preview process to print. You can go directly to the print option under the file menu or use the quick print option on the toolbar. This option will print your document exactly as you last set it up. No dialog box will appear to let you select different print options. Let's end the lesson by closing your document and then closing Microsoft Word for Windows. First, fast save your document one last time using the toolbar save button. It is an excellent idea to get in the habit of always saving your document as the last step before closing your application. Next, pull down the control menu on the title bar and select close near the bottom of the list. This will close Word and return you to the Windows Program Manager. We have one more topic to cover. As I promised at the beginning of this lesson, we are going to learn how to create and format a logo within Word 6.0. Suzanne and I will use the same version of Word within Windows 95 just to give you an idea of how this program looks in this version of Windows. Don't worry, you should still be able to follow along even if you don't have Windows 95 installed. For this next section, open a new document page using the File menu. Now let's get started. Okay Suzanne, to start our logo we need to open WordArt. Start by clicking on the Insert Menu item and select Object near the very bottom of this pull-down list. This opens a dialog box listing many object types to choose from. Scroll down the list to find and select Microsoft WordArt 2.0 and click on OK. With the WordArt program open, a box appears asking you to enter your text. In all caps type Jones, Sweet Shop, or any name you'd like to use. When done, click the left mouse button on the X located at the top right of this box. This is the new Windows 95 close button. If you're still using Windows 3.1, close this box using the control menu. Now click the left mouse button anywhere outside the box. We now have the start to our logo. Place your mouse pointer on the bottom right black square on the box outlining the text and see how the pointer turns into a two-sided arrow. Now slowly pull it down and to the right until the outline is even with the right margin and release the mouse button. Good! Grab the bottom middle box and pull it down about an inch farther and release again. That's it. Now let's give the text a unique look. Double click on top of your text to return to the word art window. Now let's change the look of the text. Click the down arrow next to the font style box. Click on Bookman Old Style. You may want to choose several styles until you find the one you like. That looks good. Now click on the down arrow next to where it says Plain Text and we get a box showing different styles you can add to your text. Select the one with the upward curve at the bottom. You could keep making choices until you find the one you like. That looks great. Now you have a logo you can size to fit any letterhead, newsletters, and envelopes. Wasn't that easy? Thank you, Suzanne. And remember, there is always so much more you can learn from me, the video professor.